Well, good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to the uh, Orchid, the Connected Researcher Forum. Uh, my name is uh, Simon Huggett. In case you didn't know, I've got two badges on just to, to make sure you know who I am. So uh, I'm uh, chair of the Australian uh, Orchid Advisory Group and uh, I'm also from La Trobe University, uh, Deputy Director for Scholarly Collections. So I'd like to welcome you here today. We, uh, we'd like today to be an interactive uh, discussion uh, amongst all of us. We're all among friends here, so it's good to see you all here and to be able to have a good discussion about how ORCID can um, enable uh, researchers to be more efficient, to be able to help manage our research better and to really promote the research uh, across our institutions and across Australia and internationally. Uh, we do have a hashtag Orchid Forum 2019. If you'd like to tweet about today, uh, that would be really great to hear uh, what you're thinking about the program and what people are saying. So that's the program we have for today. There should be, uh, I think there are some printed versions of that program. Uh, we'll be going from uh, now until uh, 4 p.m. Uh, we'll have a, a, a break for lunch, which will be across the way at a different uh, building. Uh, at lunchtime. So, um, but if you need to come and go, you need to go to the bathrooms already. We're pretty relaxed about those sort of things. Um, so, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners uh, of, of the land on which we are today. Uh, we uh, pay uh, respect to the traditional custodians of the land, uh, pay respect to elders past and present and emerging, and extend that respect to other Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And we acknowledge the role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people play in the community in Australia and uh, in our organisations. They have a really important role. So the first uh, part of the program today, I'd like to mention that we've got Slido happening to for a few polls to find out about what you're thinking. And while you're listening to uh, presentations, you can also be responding to those polls to, you know, first get us a sense of where people are at to understand uh, what the the knowledge is around ORCID IDs, where, where things are going and what you think should be happening. Um, so we have a poll on Slido. Uh, if you go to slido.com and enter uh, D220, uh, we have a poll which is what would you like to see happen with ORCID in Australia over the next five years? Now we're going to be talking about this uh, in an afternoon workshop. So but I'd like you to uh, look at that and have a think about that over the next little while so that we can generate some ideas and interest in that workshop this afternoon. So um, if you can just stay on there just for a minute so people can see what that Slido um, link is and your ideas. So we'll move on to um, the first part of the, uh, the program. What I'd first uh, like to talk about is the joint statement of principle. Uh, our member organisations have been talking about um, what the value of PIDs, uh, of ORCID IDs, bring to the research community. And we've been talking about the importance of ORCIDs, ORCID integration within research management systems and repositories. And it's been a, a bit of commentary and discussion around uh, the wording of this statement. Uh, but we, uh, all our member organisations of the consortium feel that this is a really important statement to make around uh, ensuring that when institutions, when organisations change their systems, uh, looking at new research management systems, integrating with other systems, talking about uh, repositories and integration. Uh, there are probably other systems as well which we've had some commentary around like HR systems. Uh, that having ORCID integration is a, uh, should be either a mandatory or highly recommended um, requirement for those systems to have ORCID integration. Um, we feel that because uh, systems are mature enough now to be able to deal with um, identifiers, they should be able to have ORCID as a, um, something that just should be able to be integrated really well within those systems when we procure them so that we can send a signal to vendors that this is important, that needs to be part of what the infrastructure is around our systems. Um, so uh, we feel that this is uh, an important statement to make and we've got some, we'd like you to think about um, what you've been doing in that regard in terms of integration of ORCID within your systems and what that means for the future. And when we think about what our goals are in the future, that's one of them is around our vendors and, and you know, engagement with 
with those systems to make sure that, uh, that people are aware of ORCIDs, that that's part of the integration and that can really help with uh, all the aspects that ORCID brings to uh, researchers and the activities that they, they do and, and add to the identification and authorization and acknowledgement of their research within those systems. So um, I'd like to thank our partners in the ORCID advisory group around uh, you know, developing and thinking about that statement and uh, we'll, we've put that on our website or we're going to put it on our website on the, uh, the ORCID Australian Access Federation site and, um, and then we're going to be looking at you know, what can we do in the future in terms of our future goals for this type of thing where we, we want to maximise the benefit out of ORCID IDs. So uh, I think we have one more poll just uh, to start off with. So how much do you know about ORCID and other PIDs? Uh, would be good to um, get a sense from everyone, if you can do that right now, to see, um, you know, do you know a lot? What's your actual engagement with ORCID IDs and your knowledge? Yes, sorry, Laurie. Yeah. 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 Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, the, so um, did everyone hear the question? We, we are recording um, today's session on ECHO so that we can share that on our website. So I'll repeat uh, the question. So the question really is more around you know, how are people, does it matter how people are integrating ORCIDs into their system? What kind of authorization are they using? How is it's that? It's like it's just done? there's authorization, but there's also exchange of data and other kinds of things that they can be doing. You know, yeah. and so I guess the question is, do you, as a in this statement in these organizations, do you care about the kind of functionality they're providing for Orchid, or just that they've integrated it? It's really a statement saying just that they enable Orchid IDs to be uh, integrated into those systems, so that when you go to that procurement. It's right up there front and it's important for them to acknowledge that that's really important. Um, it doesn't matter how, it doesn't matter what, as long as it's, it's in there. Certainly that's a, an on, a different uh, discussion is around what is shared and how it's shared and authorising that from, you know, what, how is that done? And I think, you know, individual institutions will do that differently. But it's really just more around uh, that this is a really important statement to make, that ORCID is a very important, highly recommended, maybe mandatory, if you want to go that way, part of um, pre, you know ensuring that that's within um, vendor systems. Okay, so the poll. I think we're able to show results of this poll live now, just to kind of get a sense of uh, where we're at, just to get a sense of who's in the room, what are you thinking around orchids. Presumably, you know a lot about orchids, or maybe you're here because you know nothing about it. I don't quite know, but we'll, it'll be good to to see that on the uh, the Slido and see sort of where we're all at. That will help with some of the discussion today. I think we've got a URL we need to go to and we'll, we'll just click on that and see what that result looks like. So just bear with us for a minute. So while we're bringing that up, we're going to have uh, Laurie Huck as our keynote speaker today. And Laurie uh, uh, tells us she has a cold that she got coming over from where <laughs> she's just come from. Oh, you travel on planes a lot, so I'm not surprised you got you get sick when you travel. So Laurie's going to put on a, a microphone so we can hear her clearly. She has a usually a pretty clear, strong voice, but I think with the cold, it might be worthwhile turning this on. Um, and I'll read oh, Laurie's biography so you can just hear a bit more about her. So Laurie is. Uh, Executive Director for ORCID. Uh, the, her biography looks like it's written by someone else, not herself. And I think what it says in her biography is very true. So Laurie <laughs> drives awareness of the ORCID mission, building strategic relationships, working with a broad range of constituents, ensuring organisational persistence and directing ORCID staff and contracts. So contractors, I think that's very true. She certainly uh, drives the agenda uh, with ORCID and has been doing that for quite some time and I think uh, the success of ORCID um, around the globe and also in this community is, uh, you know, uh, due to a lot of the, the energy and the, the will that Laurie brings to 
to the orchid organisation. I think in Australia we have over 90,000 orchid IDs assigned to Australian researchers, which is a pretty good number. And I know at different institutions there's different ways that that integration has happened. And across our consortium, I think we have 42 members of our consortium, uh, I think. 41, yeah, okay, it went, went up and down anyway. Um, and most of those organisations have a, a really strong integration with ORCID within one or more systems at, at the institution. 78%. So the, the poll, 78% uh, yes. of our members have an integration. Um, and it's often with more than one system. So, and, and it requires a lot of effort to make sure that those integrations are up to date and continue to work and uh, updated through APIs that can provide the functionality we need for, for people to be able to authenticate and authorise our ORCID IDs within those different systems. So um, that's a really good number and really pleased that that's happening at our institutions. But it does take effort and it does take investment. We're still looking at those Slido uh, results. It'd be good to just sort of see just a quick idea of the numbers in terms of what people are saying. Okay, we're just connecting on. But anyway, we'll, we'll come back to that. So I think we should, oh, here we are. So people in the audience, so 34% say that uh, they know, uh, how much do you know about orchid and other pigs? More than a little bit, 34%. That's pretty good. Uh, quite a lot is 24%. Um, I'm a pig nerd is 24%. Not surprised there's uh, a quarter of us are nerds in the, in the room. That'll create a bit of interesting discussion about what we're doing. And a little bit is 17%. So I'm probably, I'm definitely not a PID nerd. <laughs> uh, I think I know quite a lot, maybe 20, I'm probably part of the 20%. <laughs> but we'll see how we go. So could you join me in welcoming Laurie for her presentation? So thank you for having me. I absolutely love traveling to Australia. I know that sounds goofy, but I do. I love coming, and I wanted to thank Natasha for putting me up at her house. We've been having a good time. Um, she's planted some like weird phrases, so if I start cracking up, I'm sorry. We watched some really stupid movie last night that was hilarious. Um, but I'm very pleased to be here. Um, and what I wanted to talk about today, um, kind of per request, but also where we are, um, is where ORCID is in planning uh, for our next five years as an organization. Um, tomorrow, there's a presentation with the Governance Committee, and we'll be talking a little bit more about the history of ORCID um, and how we're moving more into uh, kind of a scaling stage of our startup as an organization um, and what we're doing in terms of that. We'll touch on that a little bit today. Um, but yes, ORCID's been now around for seven years. Our seven-year anniversary is coming up on the 16th of October, which is uh, pretty cool. Um, and so we put together this nice little Orchid at Seven uh, logo, and you can see the roots at the bottom. Um, and in the original hand drawing, the top of the Seven up there actually had a little tornado of activity on it, which was pretty cool, but we couldn't quite get that. But this is Orchid at Seven. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about uh, Mission Vision. Um, and you guys all know this, but we're gonna go through it again. Um, which is that ORCID, right, we don't stand alone. We're part of a community. And I'm just really pleased to be here. Australia is one of the places in the world that has a really strong community working on digitizing the research uh, community. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, but we are part of this wider digital infrastructure. Um, and then what we do, right, is enable transparent and trustworthy connections between people and the things that people do, researchers and scholars, and the things that researchers and scholars share with the community. That could be a paper, a data set, a performance, it could be an affiliation, um, it could be a mentorship. All of those things, right, are really encompassed in the scope of what ORCID does. Um, and so we enable these connections um, by providing an identifier for individuals to use, right? So we don't apply the identifier, this really is uh, from ORCID's perspective, something researchers have to be engaged with, right? ORCID is a researcher-centric organization, so everything we talk about is really about transactions between an individual, the things they do, the organizations or resources they interact with or work at, um, and then being able to store that transaction and enable the researcher to share that information with the community. <clears throat> All right, so our vision, right? is a world where these connections are made easily and seamlessly, and the researcher can easily share information, and the information as it comes across 
um, is also really clear where it came from, who is the source. Um, and again, across disciplines, borders, and time. So we are a global scoped organization. So that's our vision, right? Uh, the tools, providing the identifier, a means to connect that identifier, working with the community to build that capacity, um, and then having that vision of the world with all these connections. I think there's going to be a really great presentation from Amir a little bit later that actually demonstrates how those connections, part of which are helped enabled through ORCID, um, are actually starting to become more and more uh, dense over time, which is really cool to see. Um, so um, as part of what we do, we've developed a set of core strategies at ORCID. Um, these we actually developed with the board and the community uh, in 2016, 2017. Uh, we've reviewed them again this year, and we feel they're still relevant to what we're doing. So there's four core strategies. One is researchers, right? Position the researcher at the center of everything that we do. Um, trusted assertions is the second one, which is enabling this wide range of verified ORCID identifier to other identifier um, connections, right? So this isn't just about ORCID IDs, it's how ORCID IDs play with other persistent identifiers. Um, and infrastructure, ensuring that ORCID is persistent. Uh, the, the services we provide in the registry and the data are persistent, something that the uh, community can trust. Um, and also strategic relationships, so making sure that we are working with key organizations in the community um, who, when they adopt, can really open up some possibilities. And I was just really pleased uh, with the work that the ARC is doing. I'm glad you guys are here um, with um, the ARC grants uh, systems and uh, really, really showing the power of interconnected systems in the research community. All right. Um, uh, AAF asked me to talk a bit about what we've been doing this year. So this was kind of the tail end of our first four-year plan. Um, and in the year of the researcher, as we called it, um, we had some operational improvements. We've done a lot of work on the researcher experience with ORCID, um, as well as working to explore use cases for uh, specific groups of researchers. So um, in the uh, operational improvements, uh, we created a researcher services team um, and moved all of our user support into the researcher services team, essentially professionalizing how we do user support at ORCID. This is a big deal for us. Um, it's a big change for our engagement team, who used to do all the user support, and now that's all moved over into the tech team. I'm really, really happy we did this, and everyone else <laughs> is really, really happy we did this. Um, so we now have uh, four dedicated people working on user support tickets um, and also helping us with QA. Um, so uh, in this addition, we also hired a UI UX specialist. Um, Day, and we have somebody on the team who actually thinks about user experience with the background to do the UI UX work, including things like focus groups and how do you design questions um, and experiences for researchers to interact with ORCID and give us some feedback on new products, existing products, does this suck, does it not, how can we improve it? And that has led to loads of UI UX improvements this year, some of which have rolled out and others of which are coming. Uh, one of the big ones is item grouping. Oh my God, so anyone who's worked with researchers um, with ORCID, one of the top complaints we've had is, there is duplicate stuff in my ORCID record. This is driving me crazy. Um, and so we put in place a couple features, one of which is automated grouping based on shared identifiers in an item, um, and a second one which enables an individual to go into their record themselves and use a grouping tool to find things that look the same and bring them together. Um, you don't merge the record. What you do is kind of bring these two things together in kind of a... Um, <clears throat> Well, you bring them together and you can decide which one of them is the version that you want to be sharing publicly. So that's been working really well. And I actually went and fixed my record. I had something like, I don't know, some crazy number of items in my record and I reduced it by about a third by going through the grouping uh, section. It worked pretty well. Um, the other thing we've done is enabled uh, persistent identifier autofilling of information in the record. So there's a number of systems, tools, workflows out there that aren't automated yet that haven't necessarily integrated work, but may, for example, get a DOI for a paper. Um, and so this enables an individual to come in and say, this is the DOI for my paper, just cut and paste the DOI into a metadata field in ORCID, and we will actually call um, the source data and bring in the metadata for them. So this helps researchers uh, who don't have a workflow uh, where ORCID's been integrated to use some of these tools to help get information in the record and helps with things like ARC when you're asking folks to use your ORCID record to help fill in some of the grant uh, forms um, to help them get the information a little bit more quickly. 
Um, and then we've also got these working groups. We've had uh, two different working groups working in the arts and humanities community to identify platforms um, that the arts and humanity community uses for research and information management, um, as well as workflows and um, kind of item types um, that maybe aren't captured well in the digital space yet, and gives us some ideas like, oh, maybe we can talk to somebody about performance spaces um, and think about can we start capturing performance spaces in the research resources uh, capabilities we have in the ORCID record. Huh, that would be kind of cool. You know, we don't just have to talk about large lasers and ships, but performance spaces is another aspect of a research or scholarly space um, that may actually want to have some uh, ability to capture who is using that uh, for what purpose. Um, as well as a, um, I'll call it a Skunk Works project called Person Citations, which is trying to figure out uh, can, should, or could be a place uh, where researchers can uh, basically create <clears throat> Uh, a way to share uh, kind of a body of work of what they've done easily. Um, we're still working on that. We're just moving into focus groups, um, which will be happening over the course of probably the next two to three months to test out this concept with researchers. If it plays with researchers, we'll bring it back and talk about it a little bit more with folks. Right now, it's uh, really, really in the early stages, and I don't want to go into it in too much detail. But lots of work there. And again, having the UI UX uh, specialist on staff has been really wonderful to help us frame how do we do these focus groups. All right. <clears throat> so that's today. That's this year. It's last year. What are we doing um, into the future? So uh, we sat down earlier this year and put together a 2025 vision. So it's always nice to have a vision so you can plan how you're going to get there. Um, so <clears throat> we're starting this process. Um, and the big question was, how can we continue to provide value to researchers and the research and innovation ecosystem? Right. So that's what we're trying to do. Um, <clears throat> and we have four goals. These goals follow the four strategies I mentioned earlier. And I animated the slide so it's not like ugh, so much information in one place. So just deal with me here. Um, so goal one, researcher use, right? By 2025, we would like researchers to be able to experience ORCID as a useful, accessible, and time-saving service. All right, so there's a lot packed into that sentence. <laughs> but that's our 2025 goal. You don't want research, so that's the goal, time-saving, useful, something they want to use. So what does it mean? That requires that ORCID works with researchers so that their use cases are specified, information workflows are obvious and straightforward, right? So when somebody wants to collect an ID, this is a common experience for researchers regardless of what system they're interacting with. That means we need to do more UI UX work. We need to provide uh, more of that information to the community. Um, and we need to engage with more researchers than we have in the past more directly. Um, and again, I have a, this will and we must statements for all of these. We, ORCID, must ensure that researcher control remains paramount. So this is something that we'll always, always come back to as one of our core principles at ORCID is researchers are at the center. We're not going to do something without engaging the researcher. Researchers have to give permission for information flows involving their ID. And so this aligns with our researcher strategy. All right, if anyone has questions, just please wave your hand. It's fine. Goal two, high quality data. <clears throat> All right. So by 2025, we'd like researchers and the organizations they interact with to consider the ORCID record as a reliable source of data for filling forms and for research administration and management, and to have implemented processes that enable researchers to share their ORCID information, not just their ID, but information from the record. This is our goal. Part of this is happening today, but we'd like more of it to happen. And we would like people to think, oh, ORCID's a great place to get information for my grant management system, for my HR onboarding system, for my publication system, for my research resource system. Okay? So what does this mean? This will require that information flows to and from ORCID records is of consistently high quality including basic metadata and resolvable persistent identifiers, not just ORCID IDs, right, but all of these other persistent identifiers that we talk about. Um, and so that means we must, ORCID must, support a variety of information flows and expand support for a variety of information types, 
right? We already support something like 30 or more work types in the ORCID record. Um, we've added a whole section that supports research resources of a variety of flavors. And uh, Natasha and Adrian later are going to be talking about PID services and how can we work with organizations like ARDC to think about what are the other persistent identifiers um, that we use, that we can encourage the community to use, and how do we support that use? So things like organization IDs, equipment IDs, project IDs, um, DOIs for papers and data sets, right? Do we talk about handles? Lots of questions there, but this really is a joint effort, not just for ORCID, but others, and how do we do this? Um, and this aligns with our trusted assertion strategies. All right, goal three. Scalable business model. So my good news of the day is that we hit break even this year. Yay! <laughs> um, I was supposed to come out with green hair, but I thought that would be a little shocking, so it's just blue today. Um, so by 2025, we would like the ORCID organization to have stabilized its costs, right? We're a cost recovery nonprofit organization by scaling services through partnerships with consortia and service providers. So that's why I asked the question earlier, um, you know, how can we work with you guys? This is a fabulous statement that you have. How do we design a service provider program that works for you guys on the procurement side, but is also, um, there's enough incentive for the service providers to also be participating in it. So is it just enough to say stamp uh, this organ, this customer, sorry, this um, product has integrated ORCID, or do you want to say, oh, this product has, has integrated ORCID and by, you know, they enable um, authentication, they enable this, da, da, da. You know, do you want the gold, silver, platinum kind of stuff? I don't know. Uh, so one of the things that we're going to be doing is interacting with service providers, just like we're doing the work with uh, researchers, to test out some ideas with them and figure out what would be incentive enough for them. But having that statement from Australia is fabulous, because we can go into that and say, there are already are whole countries that have these statements saying that ORCID is a preferred uh, thing for us in the procurement process. So that's incredibly helpful. All right, but also consortia, right? So all of these things will require ORCID to better understand our service provision costs, right? I don't know how many of you have done this, and Linda, bless her heart, <laughs> has been dragging ORCID into this kicking and screaming activity-based cost modeling, ah, right? But, you know, even things like what, how do we, ORCID, define the steps to onboarding a member? Right? We have to, you know, I've asked my, the engagement team, how do you define the steps for onboarding a member? How do you define the steps that are, yeah, a member has integrated, right? So we can't do cost modeling until we actually define what is included in these different processes at ORCID. Um, so that's part of what we're working on now. Um, we've gone through a few uh, iterations. We're now in the third iteration, and we're actually going to start doing activity-based uh, cost collection for certain workflows at ORCID so that we can get a better idea of how much does it cost us to onboard a member. Um, and when we go and work and shift direct membership into consortium models, does that actually save us money, essentially, right? Save us cost and staffing because it's been moved, but at the same time, can we then enable uh, how we work with consortia to also lower the service costs for the consortia providers as well. So all of these things we're working on. Um, how do we scale? Um, we now have over a thousand members, right? We have 30 people on the team, 10 of whom are in engagement, right? We can't have one person with 100 members and then expect to scale to 200 and have one person managing 200 members. It just doesn't scale that way. If we add more people, then we have more costs, right? So how do we scale our organization, keep costs low for the community, and continue to enable the really good work that consortia are doing? So lots of things we're doing there. Okay, so goal, sorry, not the right thing to press. Goal four, broad adoption. If you haven't seen the circle diagram, oh well. Who has never seen the circle diagram? Okay, good. I figured everyone would be sick of it by now. Good. So by 2025, we'd like the ORCID virtuous circle. So if you ever hear me say this, this is the virtuous circle, okay? Uh, we'd like this virtuous circle to be in operation for these 
four major stakeholder groups, right? The researcher, again, at the center, employers of researchers, and I'm going to include membership societies there, funders of researchers, as well as publishers of researchers. And publishers can be papers, data sets, et cetera, okay? How can we get this to work so that each of these are in, um, allowing researchers to share not just their ORCID identifier, but also other information from their ORCID record in the processes of interacting, right? Um, and that also these organizations that are collecting the ORCID information are also posting information back into the ORCID record that the researcher can share with other parts of that, of the stakeholders. All right, so to do this, right, this will require organizations Right? This is where we have less control. Um, organizations to have adopted at least the primary, what we call ORCID use case, which I just described, right? In addition to collecting ORCID IDs, that research institutions will assert affiliation information. This person works for us, this person is a student with us. Publishers will assert publications data <coughs> uh, Funders will assert award information, and researchers can use their ID to share this information through this community. That's what we'd like to see by 2025. We see bits and pieces of that. In Australia, we see, whoopsie, I'm gonna go back one, two. Oh, I think this works. Is there a light? There's a light, but you can't see the light. Anyway, in Australia, we see universities collecting IDs, posting information into the record, and we see funders collecting ORCID IDs and information from the ORCID record and putting that, uh, hopefully someday soon, putting the grant information back into the ORCID record. So two pieces of this are working, and there are a number of researchers that publish, and the publishers are collecting information, but not enough yet. So this is starting to work. What we would like to see, and I was talking to Heath about this yesterday, is actually some time cost analyses here. And how can we start looking at, does ORCID actually save time? for the researcher, and does it actually provide value to the stakeholders on the outside here? Right now, this is an experiment. I am super thankful for all of the organizations who have been early adopters, but it's time for us to provide information back to you about what the value is. And so that's a big part of what we're working on is how do we do that? Okay, so we need to reduce technical barriers to adoption, and we need to stimulate best practice for collection of work and IDs, and part of that, again, is through KPIs. Okay, so aligns with our strategic relationship strategy. <coughs> so we talked about this at the beginning, that ORCID is part of this wider digital infrastructure. <coughs> As I mentioned, we use identifiers for people, places, and things, and we need you to use these too. So this is my plug uh, for ARDC and also AAF. I'm really thinking about how can we support you in the community and use of other identifiers for things like grants, for things like a publisher, right? Four things like a research resource, a ship. Um, really cool stuff that Cyro is doing. Is Cyro in the audience somewhere? Yay! Yeah, you guys are doing some really cool stuff there. So I'm hopeful that we'll get some uh, uh, some examples of using research resources, um, as well as the other work you're doing um, on the personnel side. All right. So these are my three picture slides. I hope these work for you. <laughs> I keep trying to find some kind of analogy that explains what we're trying to do, right? So imagine these are researchers, right? Each researcher has a basket, and in the basket is the stuff that they do, right? Now, you've all gone to the supermarket, or where were we yesterday, the hardware store? What was that place called, Tasha? Bunnings, Bunnings right? You've all been in Bunnings, right? And you're like, oh, there's all this cool stuff in here, right? Um, Everything has a barcode on it, right? So you go to checkout. Oh, this doesn't expand very well. But everything has a barcode. It's not just the bell peppers. Everything in your basket has a barcode. So imagine you're a researcher. You have your basket of stuff. It's your stuff. It's stuff you've done, right? Whether it's collaborative or not, it's your stuff. Everything has some kind of persistent identifier attached to it, right? So now you go and you're like, I want to share this stuff. Right? I want people to see this. And so, but I want people to know I did it. And so you can imagine, here you've got your basket of stuff. The checker rings it up using the barcode reader, yay. And then you hand over 
your ORCID ID, right? And when you go to pay, there's that little payment thing you have, everyone uses. You can kind of think about ORCID the same way. And what you guys are building are the card readers, right? That enable an individual to use their ID to connect it to all the stuff that they've done, all the stuff, not just the papers, right? That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to get you guys to build the terminals, to really think about adding these persistent identifiers to everything that a researcher does and make it super easy for them to make a connection between themselves, their ID, and the IDs on the things that they're contributing. And if you think about it, all of this stuff goes into inventory at bunnies or whatever, right? So having the barcodes, having the IDs makes it so much easier for all of you to be able to manage and understand what information this person is contributing. All right, so what about Australia? Okay, so three things. Uh, three wonderful things that happen in Australia. You have your National ORCID consensus that was published back in heavens 2016, 2015, uh, that was cross-sector, one of the few and first countries that has done this. Um, it's a strong governance model, not just an advisory council, but also a governance board. I don't know that any other country does it this way. I think it's pretty cool. <laughs> um, and I'm looking forward to talking to the governance folks tomorrow, but this is something to share. It's definitely something that has been shared in other countries and has been the foundation of other consortia, including Canada, um, for how uh, one way, a good way, to be uh, fostering um, a consensus about ORCID on the national scale, and to keep having those conversations over time. Is it working? What can we do? What can you do? Um, the second piece here that's also pretty cool is the National ORCID Consortia, which is run by AAF. Thanks for hosting the meeting today. Um, energetic and effective. You guys are always on top of things. Um, you have leadership um, both in Australia, but also internationally and globally on communications. How do you communicate with the members of the consortia? There's a lot of work that's been done here to target communications, as well as new work that's been done primarily this year on maturity modeling to further target messaging to members, right? Have you integrated ORCID? How have you integrated ORCID? Hey, there's some more stuff you can do. Can you share with the rest of the consortia the kinds of communications and engagement work you've done with your researchers? Has it been effective? Can we share some of this information? A lot of that stuff has been done here, and it's been very, very effective. Uh, one of the things that, oh, sorry, and the third piece here is opportunities for partnering on pilot projects. Um, so we're actually looking at piloting a kind of, <clears throat> I guess, beta phase product that we have for lowering the technical barriers for using ORCID for smaller um, organizations that don't have a lot of technology infrastructure. It's not fair for us to go out and expect everyone to understand what the heck an API is. It's not fair for us to go out and expect every single organization to have a really big technical infrastructure. Many don't. And so what we've been doing is trying to build a product um, that uh, basically enables uh, that whole piece, the integration work that universities do to have that be a standalone product that universities or any other organization for that matter can use. So I'm hopeful that we can get a pilot project started up with AAF. I think we have a really good target group there. Um, and because AAF has been so effective, I think it's a really good place to do the pilot. So anyway, okay. Uh, and then there's also a national pig conversation. Um, ARDC has been really good at this and also they have international influence on PID strategies as well as capacity building and skills for PID infrastructure, which is absolutely critical. ORCID is way more than an API. It's a lot of community change effort that goes into it. So these kinds of international efforts are really critical. Um, I think that's where I end the slides. Yes, yeah, so thank you for your time and thank you for your enthusiasm here. Um, I'm open for questions. Um, any questions people have about uh, where we're heading? That's kind of crazy looking. Um, there you go. Uh, we can go from there. Yeah. Uh, hello, it's Mandy from ARC. So the question is, you mentioned PID enabled item profiling. Yeah. Uh, in, 
So is that going to be user driven or is that going to be automatic? For example, there's already a lot of data there with the radio eyes in there. Uh, and what we are finding from our perspective that we sometimes get uh, much better quality if we go through the UI path. And in our integration now, we have that option for our researchers mm -hmm. that they can pull the DI, DUI data. Right. So, so again, that's a good, so when is that happening? Mm -hmm. or what does that look like? Right. Uh, if you have the details, I guess. Yeah. Um, so there's, I guess there's probably several ways to answer that question. One is, um, yes, it is user driven at the current time, right? Which is a user can say, I know this paper exists. I don't want to use a search link wizard. I have the DOI right here. They can use an interface in the ORCID record to cut and paste the DOI in. We will pull uh, the metadata associated with that using the DOI. Um, so that's number one. Number two, right, another way to answer that is uh, ORCID has been very focused on minimal metadata, right? We don't want to be this gigantic metadata store in the sky. We want to really push people back to the source information. Um, however, I think this has been a particular case for ARC, we don't always have the critical metadata, right, to support um, use cases for some of our members. And so the question is, well, do we then pull that information in and store it in the ORCID registry? Do we force uh, the user of the API to make a second API call to go back to the source and get the metadata they want, or, and this is what we're thinking about right now, and or, can we essentially <clears throat> work with our members and figure out what their metadata needs are, and then in us enable a second metadata call. When you guys say this is what we want, then we'll say, oh, this is a cross rift DOI. We can enable the API call and deliver the metadata to uh, the requester. And so that's, uh, we're working on defining the requirements for doing that piece. Does that answer your yeah. question? Yeah. More yes. or less? Yeah. We'll more, look for more details, I guess. Yeah. Uh, then, so the other one is around uh, item grouping. So that's called a, so item grouping. Oh, the, grouping, yeah. Deduplication. So what does that look like? And also, would you have a, a deduplicated ID now? Like, if you have five items and you've got a grouping now, have you, you say, by the way, and then you have some sort of a pr preferred source? Yep, yep. So, so is, preferred is that the source. Right, right, right. And so, for example, um, when I'll give you an example from my record. Uh, we have a lot of our, all of our blog posts get posted in Figshare, right? But we pre post an article in Figshare, so we have a DOI to embed in the, <coughs> pardon me, in the uh, website. And then when the uh, article is finalized, we post a second version in Figshare. So every single blog post that goes out, every single report that goes out, I get two versions of my ORCID record. Right? And so now it's saying, OK, we can enable a user or through kind of um, matching of identifiers, say to the user, this looks like a duplicate in your record. Is it? Yes. Click this button. And the, the, the item doesn't merge. It basically creates those two versions in a single record. And the um, individual can say, this version is my preferred one that I want to be available to the API. Um, so that's how we manage it. We don't merge all that information together into one record. We basically create like a file cards and then allow the users to stack the file cards and say, this top one is the one I want to be visible on the top of my record. So that leads to the API questions. So the existing API, not the new one, but the previous version. So that will remain as it is, even with all these changes? Uh, yeah, the joys of APIs. Um, so when we transition from version 1 to version 2, a lot of the backward compatibility issues we had went away. Um, version 2 to 3, the, tr the transition there, the basic metadata structure didn't change. What we did was we added sections. So version 2 to 3, we added the section for research resources. For example, we expanded how we handle affiliations. But if you're using 2, you can still use three if you don't use research resources, for example. So a lot of what we're trying to do is make sure, to the extent that it's possible, that new API versions are backward compatible. It's not always possible to do perfectly. Um, and as anyone who uses the API listserv realizes, sometimes we don't notify people. We think we did, but we didn't. And so we're trying to do better. Uh, one of the things we're doing right now is um, changing a bit of the way the organization is structured. So I talked about the help desk. Um, we also have put in place this year a dedicated product team. Um, so we started off with um, a product director 
And as of October 1st, we now actually have a product team and a product manager. So a lot of the how do we make sure things are backward compatible and how do we make sure we're alerting the community and how do we make sure that if there is an API issue that we capture that and deal with it quickly um, is going to be handled, I think, much, much better than it has in the past. Yeah. No, that's, thank okay. you. Okay, yeah. Do we have any other questions? <clears throat> group. Okay, I'm here. Okay, so uh, Lori, just one um, comment slash observation. Uh, one of the things that I've seen in the last kind of uh, year and a half, uh, uh, humanity, humanities and art and social sciences, they actually have a very specific use for ORCID. And that's actually profiling their NTR or non-traditional output mm -hmm. outcomes. Uh, now, that by itself is a quite a good value. So it's great that you actually have engagement groups with those groups that provide interesting concept. Now, I can tell you from first-hand experience, the current ORCID interface is not what someone in social sciences is kind of would be comfortable to work with. So mm -hmm. I'm glad that that's also changing. Uh, but if that transforms to something that's easy to use, like example of those kind of interfaces, you can find this in national libraries or those kind of products. Uh, and then that can provide a very good bridge to a whole new community. Interesting. Yeah, interesting thought. Um, I, I think one of the challenges we have at ORCID is, you know, how do we you know, what is our product, right? And ultimately, what we are is a database, right? And it's a database that has a, um, a user interface on the top of it that allows people to manage stuff in a database. Um, it's not, and we have been very resistant to calling it a profile system, which would have more bells and whistles, more user friendliness, et cetera. And we, you know, I think continue to think of you know, how can we interact with third party systems to deliver the information in a comfortable means, right? Um, because we can't make everyone happy, right? We, there's so many different use cases out there for researchers. For us to try to build a user, user friendly interface, given the fact we operate in every country in the world with all these different disciplines, some commercial, some non commercial, ah, right? Um, and so we are still trying to figure out how we deliver a user-friendly interface in the registry, um, uh, given those, uh, I, I guess I'm going to call it a constraint, right? Um, and um, so we're doing it kind of little by little by little as we interact with the different communities. So I think it would be, you know, this is a great example of, hey, can we set up a focus group or can we kind of create a focus group package that we can hand to folks like AEF and say, can you do some focus groups for us and help us understand, are there some basic changes we could do to the user interface there that would really be helpful and uh, make it a little bit more friendly for a wider group of people to use? So I, I don't have an answer for you. I think a lot of it is we have to do user testing. Yeah. OK, I think we're probably out of time, time for questions right, right now. But Laurie's with us the whole time. Um, I'm here all day. day. And you might want to take and i got to take it off. off. So you just a sec, yeah. So Who please join with me in thanking to? Laurie for her presentation. <laughs> Next, we have two speakers talking about maximising the value of ORCID and PIDs. So that's Natasha Simons and Adrian Burton. Um, Natasha is Associate Director, Skilled Workforce for ARDC. Uh, she has a background in libraries, IT and e-research. And Natasha has a history of developing policy, technical infrastructure, with a focus on persistent identifiers and skills to support research. She works with a variety of people and groups to improve data management skills, platforms, policies, and practices. Natasha is uh, co-chair of the Research Data Alliance Interest Group on Data Policy Standardization and Implementation. That's a bit of a mouthful. Um, Natasha is also a deputy chair of the Australian Orchid Advisory Group, and I'd like to thank her for all the work she does for the advisory group and setting up uh, things like workshops for today. Um, and she's co-chair of the Data Site Community Engagement Steering Group. Um, and Adrian Burton, Dr. Adrian Burton, is director of Data Policy and Services for ARDC. Adrian has been instrumental in. Uh, 
the implementation of PEDS in Australia. He currently works at ARDC as the Director of Data Policy and Services and sits on the Australian Orchid Advisory Group. I'd also like to acknowledge the ARDC in terms of their, uh, they've done a lot to organise today's event and I'd like to thank uh, Griffith University for hosting as well. Um, the ARDC do a, a lot of work around uh, orchids and persistent identifiers that really supports this whole uh, community. And uh, I must acknowledge a mistake I made earlier when I talked about that statement around mandatory, highly desirable orchid being within different systems. The ARDC uh, also uh, support that statement and I'll be formally following that up with you, Adrian, later on. Um, so please join with me in welcoming uh, Adrian and Natasha. And I have to thank Natasha and Laurie for having set up the talk beautifully with their reference to Bunnings and their little trip to Bunnings yesterday because I was going to explain to Laurie a whole set of cultural references which I now don't need to explain. <laughs> Could we go on to our next slide? Because. <laughs> <laughs> Now, this was already in the slide, but I made it slightly more explicit uh, in the middle of Laurie's talk. So it was part of the theme of what we're saying here is that just getting an orchid or you know, having an orchid thing at your university and getting the researchers to have an orchid, that's just the beginning. So uh, yes, we begin with the researcher. Obviously, the researcher uh, focus here, there's the researcher. Um, ignore the little icon below the researcher, that's just a, a glitch. So, and the researcher, you know, obviously the first step that we have talked about is uh, for the researcher to get uh, an orchid ID. This is a very famous one, should be quoted everywhere. It's mine. But that is just the beginning. You've got an orchid, we've identified the researcher in a, in a, a globally unique system. But what does the researcher do? So we're assuming, we're hoping that they get a grant, get some, uh, a grant from somewhere, or they uh, use those resources to uh, get some kind of an activity going. They'll collect some data, write a paper, think great thoughts. Uh, so they'll, what I'm saying here is they will actually um, uh, identify particular concepts in the scientific uh, and research world like percutaneous coronary intervention or something like that and that is the concept, the, the actual scientific concept that they're, that they're talking about. Uh, they might use some software, uh, some services, uh, have some samples, uh, reanalyze some samples, uh, use that in some kind of a research facility like a boat or a microscope. Uh, all this will happen at different places and times and they will also need to be related into this whole mesh of information. Uh, the whole thing could actually happen on a, on a workflow uh, that may well be documented and all of these things are related to different research organisations as well. So now We've got a researcher, but it's a lot more complex for the researcher. There's a lot more stuff going. It's not just identifying the researcher, it's identifying the researcher's relationship with all these different uh, sort of elements of the research uh, universe. Now, I could start drawing lines here, but I thought that's, I'll let you draw those lines. There are lots and lots of lines, and they're, not, and they're going all over the place as to where those things actually happen. But that's what where uh, this is, it's not just having the identifier for the researcher, it's the researcher's relationship with these kind of things. Here's the interactive part of the talk. Because if, it, if there were only just two or three, if there was just one grant in the world and one researcher, then you wouldn't, you just have to say, well, obviously that's that researcher's uh, grant and what's all the fuss about linking all this information together. So here's the uh, interactive part of it. Uh, at the ARC, in the last 20 years, how many grants have been awarded? Anyone in the audience know that information? Mandeep. 47,000. 47,000. 27,000. In the world, Laurie? 
way more than that. <laughs> so let's say we're 2% of the world, whatever, what's uh, 50 times that? Okay, fine, 50 times 27,000, you know, that's just one fraction of Australia. So that's lots. So we're talking millions there to probably, uh, yes, millions. All right, uh, publications. Anyone from Crossref here today? How, uh, again, well, sir, what do you think? Five and a half research outputs uh, in Australia, is that right? Through the era thing. Uh, how many journal articles are registered with Crossref? 107 million, we have a bid here. So let's say there's uh, data sets. Who knows? Each research article would have a couple of data sets behind it, probably. Uh, a certain number that have been registered within data sites, there'd be uh, LSIDs and all sorts of uh, other identifiers. So we're probably talking hundreds of millions there, I think. Concepts. How many, co how many scientific concepts could there possibly be in the world? That's not really a finite set. Bits of software, we have no idea how many there are out there, but there are heaps. Um, samples, what do you think there, Laurie? What's... I was at the IGSN meeting the other day and a guy walked in from the European um, Museums Consortium and they were talking about scale. How many identifiers do we need for samples in the world? And uh, people were saying, oh, well, we probably need uh, 500,000 here. Data site might have, you know, 20,000. Uh, and he said, oh, we probably need to do our back catalogues of the museums. This was a museum consortium. We would need 2 billion to, to identify all the sample, to do a back catalogue of samples. And that's assuming they don't collect any more on museum digs. Um, how many institutions are there in the world? So, okay, actual number. Six, six million data site data sets. Okay, there you go. 105 million already in the software. <laughs> 96,000. Yeah, I'm glad that uh, Amir's right here in the, in the front seat. <laughs> Made it very interactive between me and Amir and Mandeep. Uh, 96,000 organizations. So that's why it becomes more complex. I, you know, there's little me with my amazing research uh, outputs. And I'm struggling to compete with, you know, 100 million other journal articles and, you know, five or ten million other grants and around the world um, and the ANU's recognition amongst you know a hundred thousand other research organizations and the we didn't ask the question about researchers Laurie what are we talking about 7.2 million in ORCID do we have an idea of of how many active researchers in the world about 35 is the target yes and they keep dying and being born again being <laughs> <laughs> The dying, does, the orchid doesn't go away when they die, but more, more generations come out. So I don't know if anyone's been keeping up with all the maths, but if we did the n times n here, that's quite a lot. And if you're trying to get your information, you know, what was the I? Why did we have the? Why did I get my orchid in the in the first place? It was to get my information uh, linked to me and out there in a very, very, very big world. I feel like one of those preachers, you know, that says, do you know how big infinity is? You know, how, you know what, what was it? Uh, everlasting damnation. You know, the, you know, the definition of everlasting damnation. Do you know how long eternity is? <laughs> one grain of sand every year added. <laughs> and this beach would only just be the beginning of eternity, you know. So that's a, yeah, okay, so I'm exaggerating now, but that's a very big information space. And if it were, if there were just a few, then it would be easy enough to say that's my grant, but it's not. Uh, and all of these systems, so ORCID in one sense, as uh, Laurie was saying, is a big database of uh, researchers. And it does a whole set of other things, but the really good thing it does is act like a, in, in, a, in a distributed kind of, information system and think of it as a distributed database, then Laurie has the table of people. 
and you can refer to anywhere in the world and you know, in any information system in the world and say, use this is the key for that researcher, and you can you can have your place there in that in that uh, in that world. Um, so that is why we, uh, that's why just having the identifier is just the beginning. We need to have your systems integrated out into those global systems so that you could go to you know, the University of Queensland, could go to a publisher and say, well, uh, here's my uh, ORCID ID, uh, of, you know, the, and you tell me. So you'll have all the, the global information systems that are out there, ORCID aggregating stuff, but even the stuff that ORCID doesn't have. If you, if you have a way of interrogating this international distributed uh, information system, uh, using sophisticated methods, not just saying, oh, it's John Smith or it's Adrian. Which Adrian? The Adrian. <laughs> no, you know, uh, we, you need, if you want to have a sophisticated information system, you need to have uh, a sophisticated information approach. And that's, what, that's why we have the ORCIDs. That's the first step. The second step is for us to try and integrate that stuff. Uh, integrate your information world, your university's world, into all these other, uh, uh, the global information system. So uh, thank you to Amir and uh, who in a previous life uh, assisted us within uh, the ARDC. We run a, a research catalog called the uh, Research Data Australia. Uh, it's a catalog of data sets. They're a piddly 150,000 compared to all those numbers now uh, of data outputs from researchers in Australia. And we are trying, we are just w one part of that trying to say, okay, research world, what's out there? Uh, you know, how is this, okay, we've got a data set, so what, what does that mean? What's its context? Who, who made it? What grant helped to make? What kind of uh, research outputs were involved? Um, so uh, we now have uh, every page in the Research Data Australia catalogue has a little graph like this and we use, and I th I'm assuming we're going to get more information on the kind of approaches uh, that help this to happen, but anyway, it's Amir's magic in the background. Um, and here you've got a picture of a data set, it's the one in the middle there, uh, and uh, it's related to three other data sets, so they're the orange ones that they represent uh, data sets. It's related through a whole mesh of other relationships to a whole set of people, the researchers and contributors. It's also related, and thank you Justin and uh, Mandeep, although what is it, pharmaceutical, that's ah, probably your colleagues at the NHMRC, uh, to two grants, these yellow ones are, uh, are grant records. And there's two publications, the ones in blue are publications. Now this is by no means, um, what's the word, complete or comprehensive, but it's where we're trying to head to say, okay, what's the, um, what's the relevance of this research data set? You know, where does it fit? And we don't want to have to collect all that information, but we want to be able to, using identifiers, uh, to be able to push out into the global information system and pull back whatever we can. So that's an example of our, you know, of, uh, of uh, why it's important to have this more sophisticated uh, information approach to identifying things in the research uh, universe and the kinds of things we can start to do uh, with that. So getting back to our Bunnings theme, just having an ORCID is just the beginning and I'm hoping that you know, uh, I was very heartened to see that 72%, was it, Simon, uh, had not just allocated uh, identifiers to their researchers in their institutions, but had done some kind of integration. So the first step is to have plugged in systems. So the, I'm assuming the integrations that we've started are the ones where you integrate back into your own systems, but think about the opportunities you've got to uh, interrogate out into uh, the whole research ecosystem, the information ecosystem, to plug your systems back out. Uh, we probably need 
identify our aware people. So there are, in that diagram, and I think that's where Natasha's going to go, in that diagram of all those things that were part of the outputs and the activities of a researcher, almost all of those, uh, there is an opportunity to use a, a globally unique persistent identifier that has some kind of a registry behind it. So for um, data sets and software, you know, there are emerging uh, ways to refer to these elements in, in much more sophisticated ways using persistent identifiers. But I'm glad we, you know, the, the, the participants today are part of the research support infrastructure parts of the university. We need somehow to, without confusing the, the research sector and saying how many of these 17 digit numbers do I have to remember, uh, just to make it easy at the time when they're publishing an article or depositing a data set to say, oh, remember, you have an identifier. The journal article, article has an identifier. Uh, now, we need to make that process simple for them, uh, but they do need to be aware that you know, by just you taking some important steps when they're referring to these other, oh, the grant that I did, oh, that does have an identifier. There's a way of looking that up at the ARC. Uh, if we can make that our researchers a little bit identifier aware or make it easy for them, uh, then that will be a, a really big step forward as well. Because there's no use having the ORCID identifier if it's not being seeded in all these other systems and the relationship to the other identifiers uh, made explicit. And the last thing, and I think that came up in uh, Laurie's talk, was we really need to solve some problems with this. You know, so that's not just the, having the identifier is just the beginning. You need to solve a problem. You need to say, okay, it used to, you know, getting a, a, a view of all our research puts used to cost us, you know, three million dollars in staff time over over a year uh, by getting the identifiers, integrating with our systems, and integrating with international systems. We've solved the problem it now costs us 500,000 or something, and that's the work that Laurie's talking about. But we need to think about, okay, these are tools, the identifiers, what problems, what actual problems can we uh, uh, solve with them? And the key ones that are being looked at now is the, for example, the good news is that with that whole uh, information ecosystem, there are lots of people connecting things for you. So Crossref and DataSight, the two different, the, uh, the key sort of identifier minters for journal articles and, and, and data sets, are working on a, a system between the two that says, okay, well, what journal articles had references to data sets? Now, if you run a research data repository, someone else making that link and you being able to say, oh, actually, I'm gonna use the sophisticated uh, new information world, I'll throw my DOI for my data set out and ask that system, does it, has it made any linkages to uh, publications that are being made on my behalf? So I suppose that's the good news. The bad news was that you had a scary sermon on the, on the, the size of the eternal information uh, ecosystem. The good news is that there's lots of things happening in our ecosystem to, uh, that are uh, that are helping you to solve the problems that, that you're trying to solve uh, in your research institutions. Natasha. <laughs> Thank you, Adrian. <laughs> so uh, hopefully you got from the last uh, couple of speakers that it's uh, fantastic to be investing in ORCID and there's a lot that can be achieved from that. Um, but to really maximize the value of your investment, you also have to invest in other persistent identifiers um, that can help you get a bigger picture of uh, research and where it's connected and how it's, and to better make it discoverable and also to better track its impact. And um, Amir, I, I hope um, a lot of your thunder has not just been stolen then. <laughs> <laughs> but I think, uh, yeah, you'll, you will talk about some of those connections. So I just wanted to finish off what Adrian said. Um, just to talk, um, so there's a lot of persistent identifiers out there and it's actually a bit confusing. So um, speaking to you as infrastructure providers and as people at research institutions that invest in this, how do you know which ones to invest in, uh, which ones should researchers use? It's, there's a lot. 
There's really quite a lot. There's what we call a long tail of persistent identifiers for all kinds of things. Um, and so at ARDC, we've sort of been working on, well, what would be the core persistent identifiers that you would actually need to make your research discoverable, to make it really connected in that sort of public uh, part of research. So not the ones that you might use in your systems that are for identifying within an institution or within a particular discipline maybe, but there's things that you really need when your research is going to be public. And these are some of the things that we are uh, thinking about. So with researchers, I think ORCID is the obvious one and everyone I think understands that here, so I won't uh, repeat that. For grants, um, there are digital object identifiers, DOIs, um, which came from the publishing industry. They're actually the things that are more and more used for grants internationally. They're a really good identifier for grants. Um, however, in Australia at the moment, we have um, a PERL service, a Persistent Uniform Resource Locator, that's what it stands for, but it's basically a different type of identifier to a DOI. And um, that's actually issued through the ARDC at the moment. We create a SWASH page for the ARC and NHMRC records, and there is a grants discovery portal where you can find that information, and you can then link the grant identifier with your data set or with your publication. Um, um, or you can put it in an ORCID record. Um, for publications and data, I think it's pretty clear that DOIs are the best thing to be using for your data sets as well as for your publications. Of course, you've got uh, different agencies to get them from at the moment. You have Crossref uh, who assign the DOIs for publications and Datasite, or you can go through ARDC for the uh, DOIs for data. Um, Okay, so some of the other things you might want to assign identifiers for are physical samples. So these are things collected during the course of research. Um, there's a, a identifier called the International Geo Sample Number. And if you just kind of think of the G as a bit silent, it can actually be applied to all kinds of physical samples collected during the course of research. And um, the ARDC has become a, a allocation agency for IGSN in Australia. So that's, uh, yeah, it's built on DOIs, but it's a little bit in terms of the technology, but it's it's a little bit more lightweight. So that's probably a very good identifier for samples. You can still use DOIs um, to assign to samples, but it's not quite as robust or it doesn't quite scale as well as IGSN does. In terms of research organisations and the uh, type of identifier you'd assign, there's actually quite a lot of choices there and um, they all offer different things. So really just put up a few there. RAW, the Research Organisations uh, Registry, which is an open source uh, database. Uh, Grid, which comes from digital science. Uh, digital science are also involved in the raw database, just to confuse you a little bit there. However, you can go through Grid, uh, slightly different um, service and slightly different offerings there. And Ringgold is another one, and the one that ORCID uses for their organisations. Um, also, in terms of projects, uh, who has heard of RAID? Quite a few people, yeah. Okay, that's, oh yes, and there's the RAID, the chief RAID PIDS nerd right up the back there, Siobhan McCaffrey. If you have any questions about RAID, please go see Siobhan. Um, so uh, the research activity identifier is at its base level, it's a handle identifier, but it, it creates a container record of things that happen during the course of a project. So you assign it right at the start and it might assign, um, it might collect a digital, uh, an object identifier for um, the data management plan that you started with and it might um, record something where you use particular research infrastructure like the Nectar Cloud. Um, it might look at the storage you used at your institution and record that in the container level, uh, in the container file, and then end up recording the DOI for the data set. So you can actually see through the course of the project what types of infrastructure and services were used, which is actually really useful for research institutions to see um, how did people use my infrastructure, what kind of national infrastructure are they using, where did their data sets end up, what articles were produced, what researchers were involved. So that's, that's where RAID fits in. Um, next one. Yep, uh, so that's just, uh, uh, that's probably some of the core uh, identifiers that I think we're looking at in terms of public identifiers for research. So this, this slide looks at how um, PIDs fit in research workflows and some of the identifiers that we might use. So people and organisations uh, identifiers are obviously useful for education, training and employment type information. Um, ideas, that currently doesn't have an identifier, although, you know, maybe there's some discussions to be had around when you put an identifier, an idea, or where it gets recorded. Um, also, funders uh, identified through RAW or some other organisation, grid registry, something like that. Um, 
There's also, uh, in terms of grants and projects, uh, that's really important at looking at the samples, the people and organisations involved, the equipment. So there's a bit of discussion happening internationally about what identifier you assign to research instruments. Um, at the moment, you can assign DOIs to them, but is that the best one? That's, that's current discussion at the moment. Um, and activities through the RAID. Um, also, the outputs, obviously, we talked about DOIs um, and um, the future, looking at how, uh, what kind of identifiers we need to mark that step in preserving, analysing and inspiring. Okay, so just to close, in terms of maximising the value of PIDs for uh, us as research uh, institutions and research infrastructure providers, um, some of the messages that I think are important are to assign PIDs early and often. So. Uh, as early in the process as you can is really the place to put them and often meaning don't get um, don't get stuck in oh I don't know which one I can't assign any which is I think kind of happens it would be better just to pick one and assign it than to have none at all um, because that's it's just better to have a world of PIDs where you can pick these things up than to actually leave it and not assign them. And there's a bit of work going on at the moment to link um, handles and DOIs as well so that you can say this data set once had a handle on it and it now has a DOI and they actually link that through the metadata. Um, also providing good metadata when assigning PIDs is really important. So I don't know if you, you heard that through the last presentations, but um, there is uh, work, there is metadata exchange between ORCID, DataCite, and Crossref, and, that, and they exchange it on the metadata level. So that's really important to link people with articles and, and uh, data sets. Um, also, uh, to use the PIDs toolbox that I just mentioned, to build PIDs into systems and into research workflows is really important. So PIDs are best adopted if they're actually part of the research workflow. So I think that's where ORCID really works, is where you're submitting an article to a, a journal and the journal says, what's your ORCID? And that's the point at which you get your ORCID or provide your ORCID. That's where the adoption really happens at its best. And if you go outside of that and you say, hey, researcher, come and get an ORCID, it's great. It's actually so much harder, and I'm sure you can relate to that. It's actually really hard. It's like, why? What do I need that for? As opposed to, actually, it's part of this workflow, and when you publish that article, then that information is going to be recorded on your, uh, on your ORCID record. Your institution is going to get notified of that. It's going to go into institutional database and save you typing all that information, etc. So make them part of workflows wherever you can. Um, connect to PID systems, meaning like authenticate against the ORCID registry, um, and also connect to systems that consume PIDs. So I, uh, Adrian gave the example of Research Data Australia, so we contribute um, the, uh, those PIDs from Research Data Australia into international systems like Scolix, which Amir will talk about. So it's really important to actually contribute to those systems as well. And finally, use tools like PIDGraph, um, which is that, uh, well, that's the sort of nickname for the uh, connections graph that Adrian and showed and which Mir is about to talk about to track the impact of research um, researchers and research organisations. So I'm going to close there and um, I don't know if we want to move straight into a mirror or if we're doing questions. We'll probably have time for one or two questions if anyone has any. Thank you. I'm losing my voice or trying to get it back again or something. But uh, thanks. That was that was a really good presentation. I'm Sue O'Brien from UQ. I'm interested in um, using persistent identifiers with equipment. Can you talk about any, because we're, we're building a whole sort of ecosystem at UQ and over 80% of our researchers have an ORCID already, um, but what we want to also be able to do is to track, for example, national infrastructure that we ho hold at UQ and link to grants, link to ORCIDs, link to publications. Can you make a comment on infrastructure? DOIs and I'll talk about it. I'd be really happy if you all well, talked about it. So you can see that it's an active discussion. We're trying to work out who's best. I think Natasha's comment, look, pick one, you know, and, and so there's, for ORCID we have a whole section and we're working, for example, with Cyro on, on um, <clears throat> uh, research resources, right, and Adrian mentioned samples, right. I think... So, so does that mean we can add an ORCID to an instrument? No, 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 no. No, I didn't know. No, 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 no. No, orchids are only for people. Only for people. 
no, no, no. <laughs> so no but what, we're, what I'm saying is that, like, so we work with other identifiers, right? And so for the big resources, when things that kind of sit in place, uh, you can imagine, or like a ship, right, which kind of sits in place, um, you can imagine using an organization identifier, right? And so, for example, Grid and Whore have organization identifiers for the larger things the resources, which could be a performance space, it could be a ship, it could be a, a laser, it could be a telescope, right? So they're looking at, or a number of organizations are doing that. We've been working with Department of Energy in the United States, and they are using organization identifiers for the laboratory, the big facility, and they're using an organization identifier for the um, kind of bricks and mortar uh, laser facility, for example. But then they use a different type of identifier, which could be a handle, it could be a DOI, it could be an internal barcode for the piece of equipment that is attached to the bleh at the facility, right? And that's how they've handled it. And I think the idea is try to create, you know, use a, a an identifier that works in your circumstance. If it's a piece of equipment that you can move around and may not be in the same place, an organization identifier is probably not the right thing. But whether you use a handle or a DOI or a mm, something else really kind of depends on your circumstance. And the big challenge is to make sure that whatever identifier you use is persistent and that the metadata is openly available. So that when somebody tries to navigate back to using that identifier, they actually see information about the thing you're referring to. Um, with equipment, uh, there is a whole RDA working group, Research Data Alliance working group on equipment identifiers. They're working on describing kind of minimal metadata sets for equipment. My pitch here, and we were talking about this on the car on the way here, um, is don't try to describe all the settings in your identifier. The settings, in my maybe not so humble opinion, should be part of your data set that you got off of the equipment. But there's still discussion. Something that, that helps you identify. identify this was the scanning electron microscope. Or right, yeah, this is the microscope. You, you don't care and then how you set the microscope. Exactly, up. right. But yeah. again, that's an open conversation that is not quite yet resolved in the community. So there's no answer, there's a options. Yeah, here. Yeah. Also, um, the research infrastructure providers like ARDC are really important, interested in this conversation because we need to be able to demonstrate back to our government investors that what they've invested in has actually helped produce research outcomes. So there's a bit of discussion and reflection going on in ARDC about it. And we've looked at Merrill, which is a European um, registry of research infrastructure providers and you know uh, whether we could do something similar here perhaps or what that would look like in oh, terms I'll of the identifier. Talk to you in the break because UQ would be very interested in maybe working in partnership yeah. to set up a system that cool. could be a model system. Okay, great. We'll talk out okay. offline. Yeah, thanks. So as a quick follow-up to that, um, my understanding with the Research Data Australia, the services entity was sort of fulfilling that role in some way, that it was a persistent identifier for a service, and that could often be infrastructure that's been funded, say, through the ARC LEAF, but it could be anything really, but probably it probably got matured to a platform. Is that correct or not? Uh, in, so two separate things here. One is an identifier for an instrument or a service like that, and the other is a description of it. Research Data Australia does have pages in it that, because we have a data set, then people wanted to say uh, it came from this instrument. So we do have some descriptive pages in there. We haven't got into the, you know, that was 10 years ago. So it was well before people even thought about, well, what's this global thing like and would the each instrument need an identifier? So yes, there are descriptive pages up there, and our information model certainly can ex you know, expands and, and takes that in. What we haven't done is, um, and that's where you're at now with these uh, um, with the instruments, is that you could probably use two or three, as you've heard, ways to mint an identifier for it. There's no national global registry to hold all the metadata in one place. So we're we're so that we're in transition. So uh, it would be good to get some metadata for your instrument, get an identifier for it, and then be ready to uh, adapt. Okay, we're kind of running out of time trying to move forward here. So could you join with me in thanking Natasha and Adrian? So our next uh, presentation is about PIDGRAPH, which we've already heard a little bit about. So um, I think Melroy and um, Amir have uh, 
have, pre have prepared this presentation, but Amir is going to be our presenter today. And Amir is head of social data analytics, the, the social data analytics lab in the Social Innovation Research Institute at Swinburne. And Amir can introduce uh, what he does there and what the feed graph is about. So please join me in thanking Amir. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Simon. Just check to see if this microphone works, if walk away. Okay, good. So, yes, as Simon mentioned, I have a role in Swinburne leading the social data analytics lab. Uh, but also I do a couple of different things. One of them is being involved into the uh, different ORCID-related activities. Uh, I'm still part of the whole consortium of people in Europe working on the persistent identifier links, uh, working on the data site technical advisory group. I'm also on the board of Research Graph uh, Foundation, which is a not-for-profit organization, works almost on all the spectrum that Adrian was talking about. So, you know, Adrian gave the introduction I needed to do, so I can just skip right through the actual main content. Um, so, yes, the, the thing I was going to talk to you about that before Natasha add more items to my agenda <laughs> was I was going to talk about the, uh, the collaboration networks, then talking about the PID graph and how you leverage it using the Augment API, and also I've been talking about some examples of some examples of international links and also the national or international collaborations that we can drive from the ORCID data. But following what Natasha said, I will also mention the colleagues. And what else do I have in my list? <laughs> uh, well, the PID graph also is obviously the item. Okay, so now the traditional RMS systems, the research management systems, they usually ask questions like. Well, how many publications a group published? How many grants that they got? Uh, how many patents they have registered? Uh, number of PhD students, staffs, uh, how many graduates that they have? This is what we usually measure when it gets to the research office. Now, if we go to the next one, these are the sort of questions that we probably also should ask that most of the time we don't ask. That how many grants that they didn't get? Like how many opportunities has been missed? Uh, people often go to the conference to realize that, oh, there is another group on the other side of the work, uh, world work on the same topic as they are doing here. Uh, we don't talk about the sort of collaborations that they have missed or they don't actually get into, they're not involved in those things that they should be involved in. It. Uh, we also don't talk about the industry engagement that often is missing from these things. I'm glad that uh, Laurie brought the employers into that equation because some of those employees and employers relationships goes into the industry after uh, leaving their uh, university job. Uh, now, this is kind of changing the behavior from the uh, reactive to proactive. Rather than just reporting of what actually is happening right now, looking at what, what can be done and how to optimize the actual uh, functions of different research groups. So, um, now, I grabbed this one from the uh, Harvard uh, Business School quote on the networking. When it gets to the business networking, there are four pillars of networking that's important. And I think to some degree, that also relates to the researchers in that space. You need to first uh, identify the network. You need to know what the network is. You can't talk about network without actually having a picture of that network. Then you need to actually look at the, the components in that network. You need to break down that network to different type of uh, subcategories of participants in that network. And from that, you can actually leverage value to know exactly who are your main uh, sponsors, who are your main collaborators, who are your active players in the network. <coughs> the other component is that we need to have a tools and analytics capability to examine the network. This is kind of what we call network analytics. There is a lots of different tools and platforms. But in a practical point of view, you need to have the, I would like to use the term network awareness, having the platform in front of your team to understand exactly what is happening at any engagement. If you bring someone new to the team, how that network, how that network has evolved or will evolve. And the last thing is that this is a kind of a very businessy term from that perspe perspective to cultivate the relationships. So that's following up with the relationships that you identify. Now, uh, from practical point of view, we started to look at this from um, actually real research groups. So we took uh, our own team at Swinburne as a guinea pig. I don't offend anyone. And we said, okay, well, there's a group of people working for Social Innovation Research Institute. We kind of randomly, we knew who are the main collaborators, so from which universities, 
that are involved, with which industry we are working with. We actually had a meeting about this to identify who we are working with. It proved to be much more complicated than we thought. Uh, and then which countries are from. So the list is actually much longer than this, but this was the sort of activity each group can do if they sit together and collect the information. Now, I promise to talk about the peat graphs so and maybe just put a pause on that note and get into the, and then I will connect these concepts later on together. So in the other part of the universe is what uh, Natasha and uh, Adrian was talking about. Uh, there is this graph of a scholarly communications that link information together. We have the softwares, we have data sets, we have publications, we have grants that are awarded by different funders. All of these relationships together is almost like a LinkedIn type database, but just for researchers. I think this is to some level what ResearchGate actually harvesting from the research communities and leveraging that data. That is a power that everyone and all universities can actually benefit from. Uh, and this is, this is a picture of the peat graph work that it is running by the FRIA project in Europe, that is the Horizon 2020 funded projects. And uh, Adrian and Natasha is also part of the same activity. The main players in this group are basically the main identifier providers. Now, I just grab one of them as an example, and I'm going to use this example later on to answer the question about what can happen to a one research group. So you have a researcher A has a publication to researcher B, and researcher B can be from another university. So researcher A from Swinburne, uh, let's for the sake of example, is myself, and then researcher B is from uh, Cornell University. <coughs> and yes, so this, is, this is a connection between me and the Cornell University. So there is a point here that I know someone at the Cornell University. It's almost like you go to the LinkedIn and think about, oh, I want to know who worked in there, for example, Microsoft Research. So you are looking for a connection there. This is an example of that. So these similar connections can be formed more complicated. We can have the paper is one example. We have the data set. So two researchers can be the co-curator, custodian, um, even uh, loosely related to a data set, but somehow they are connected to the concept of a data set. And that actually takes you to another institution. So let's say I work with another uh, researcher from Oxford and creating the social resilience data set. And that actually are connections uh, across these two universities. We have grants, that is the most clear model of actual engagement. We have two CIs from two universities working on the same grant. And the thing is that the institutions are linked to country, and actually not one country, usually more than one country. So universities have campuses in different places, you would actually have a one too many relationship here. If you grab all of that relationship and simplify it, you can have the researcher to researcher, and the researcher to institution, and institution to country. So you basically go from the individual researchers in a group to a list of countries and universities that are collaborating with. So this part, I think, should have been simple. Is, before I move ahead, is there any ambiguity about this part? All good? Okay, moving forward. So we, uh, what I explained is, automate, uh, is not automated process. It's a very manual, step-by-step -step process. There was a, a bit of engine that we developed in the early days in the Search Data Alliance, and Adrian and I have collaborated on this one significantly. Uh, that code has evolved to be an enabler for a very large distributed graph. Uh, it has plugins from different sources. So it actually has ORCID integration. It has a Crossref integration. It has this Colix, which is a big pool of records that shows the connection between the data sets and publications. Almost all the a majority of publishers, actually I forgot the number. Do you have, Adrian, the number? How many publishers contributing to this? Yeah, the irony is that I, I was the person who made the report for Adrian, and I don't remember the answer to that. But uh, there was a substantial number of publishers who contribute to this pool. And uh, then we have a data site and so forth. There's a long list of plugins that we have for this engine. But what it does at the end, it produces graphs. And we initially made this for a completely different purpose. The idea was at the time to grab two different data sets, one from University of Sydney, another one from Dryad, and see if there is a connection here. So we were working initially not on the researcher activities, but at the data activities. But the same engine can be used for other purposes. So if we look at, uh, 
white dog. I should just put that one. So I don't know if you can see this from the back. This is a map of the world with all the different dots that they represent the uh, Australian collaboration using the same model. Probably it's not visible. This is probably more visible. So this is uh, the shade of green of the uh, same map that shows different countries by the density. So Australia by far most has the most number of collaboration with US and China. I'm assuming that would not be surprised for anyone. Uh, but in fact, actually more than 90% of our international collaboration has a link to one of these two countries uh, based on the data sets that we have. So it's quite a substantial link of connections. Uh, now, we, this was a work that was initially kind of came out of the engagement that Melroy kind of pulled it off. Uh, I think Melroy and Natasha had a chat and they said, okay, well, we want to do something with ORCID data. And then that's what we actually made it happen in 2018 in the e-research conference. So at the time, we figured out that, okay, well, we can visualize this graph in different ways. If you look, should, it's another bad example of dark screen and the, uh, in a very bright uh, presentation. So you probably can't see that much. This is a graph of the whole ORCID consortium and all the links. This turning off the light might help. Yes, that's good. <laughs> Maybe then we just go back to the two other slides. Okay, so this is the map of the world. That's much easier to see. So this is everywhere that Australians are collaborating in different countries with the, uh, with the actual volume densities in different universities. And uh, this by itself is uh, solely ORCID data. So this is not the augmented data. This is actually just the data you can get out of the ORCID corpus in 2018. Um, now, going to the next one, this is the presentation of the same concept, but just the density of the color is based on the country. And we kind of almost co collaborating with everybody. Now, this is the kind of visualization. So color representation is for different countries. So each point is a color. Uh, again, this is one of those examples that you look at something and say, okay, this is great, but I have no idea what it means. Yeah. So visually it looks good, but practically, I don't know. So we kind of slice and dice it. This is a graph of Australia and the UK. So the blue ones are Australia and the UK. Uh, all the dots are uh, um, uh, universities in the UK. And this is basically cut out of the same uh, previous visualization. We basically, basically turned off everything else, and we only show you the UK. Now, <clears throat> this is our other attempt to see how it's gonna actually make sense. Um, this is the presentation of the same data in a data analytics tool, and we test this for the uh, Swinburne University. That shows the Swinburne connection to all other uh, global collaborations across, the, uh, across different countries. Now, the problem of all of these visualizations and what we realized in 2018, last year, was it's good, but there is no specific added value. We can't just get anything out of this apart from the good presentation. It might make a very entertaining time for Melroy and I when we go to different conferences, but beyond that, there's no value in it. So we, uh, this year, we said, okay, well, who can actually benefit from this? And it's actually very interesting because I didn't know any of the things that Lori was going to talk to you about today. So I think our effort is aligned with the ORCID 225 vision. So they said, let's go to the researcher and see how researcher can actually benefit from this. So we said, okay, so our research group, we went with them and said, okay, let's get all of the data together. Let's use the same data, only extract the information that related to this group and see what we can do with it. Um, so I can actually show you what we have done. And it's very much a prototype. It's not a real system. Well, actually, it is come from research graph, but it's done by uh, what are called PID nerds. So uh, this is, the, the way this, to do this correctly, you need to actually talk to these people, except me, and see actually what it means for them and how they're going to use it. But we didn't actually do that. We just, we use our data analytics capability to build the system using the data to say, okay, well, who are our collaboration networks? So here in this graph, if I just remove all the filters. So this is uh, four people from our group. And what we have done from the same chain that I mentioned, I basically put all of their collaborations on the map. Uh, and the top overall collaborations are with this country. So together we have all of these people together, they have 450 papers 
uh, with Australia, 93 with UK, 76 with US, and so forth. Now, if you look at one researcher in this case, with, uh, let's start from Jane Farmer, who's the director of the institute. So you can look at his collaboration network. And what we have here is, uh, well, we can see in Australia, he published with the researchers in these universities. Actually, I realize it's probably hard to read from the back. Uh, so you can see the name of the individual institutes. Not all of them are universities. And as you see here, we have like a Bendigo Health. That's where we have an industry level engagement. Uh, and then you actually see that in the bracket is a number of publications with that institute. She even has a, coll a collaboration in Ireland, uh, University College Cork, National University of Ireland, and so forth. So you can see the places that she has collaborated with. That is a very long screen. Okay, so you, now there is, so this was one example of active researcher, and in that case you can see uh, in that Jane has worked with 38 universities. Now I can look at the one other researcher in this case, which is Catherine White. The reason I picked this one is um, there was a grant recently that I was trying to actually put together, and I was looking for someone who has worked with Alfred Health. So as part of this, I actually sent an email to about half a dozen people at university and asked, who is working with Alfred Health? I need a connection there. That effort took a bit of time and sorted out, and we found someone else from the Department of Health. While I was doing this exercise, we realized, oh, Caroline used to work with Alfred Health, and we didn't know that. So this example of even the members of the group, they don't know the line of collaboration. Now, moving back to this, and you, that, and then the same thing, you can look at the other collaboration networks like myself. And um, one of the other things, interesting facts, that I didn't know that, that when I was working uh, with this tool, I realized, okay, well, I worked with all of these universities that I didn't know before. So you actually work with people, but later on they move to different organizations. And you technically have connections in those places that you don't know it later on. Again, the information in this page is ORCID data, that it is augmented with the research graph information. So this, this information is a, if you, know, if you like, it's an ORCID plus. So there's extra information added to that from other players. Now, on this line, basically, as I mentioned, this is a very much a prototype. They're working, trying to get this one running. For us, basically, the next line of this uh, would be the concept of co-designs. So exactly like what Lori mentioned, we are working with the researchers, and the, the idea is that they will continue working with them to identify exactly what does it actually mean for uh, researchers in social science, in uh, biology, in chemistry, and then basically understanding that what, what would be useful information to get for them. Some of the things we have already identified, the one that I mentioned is the non-traditional outputs. That's the one that stood out quite well from early engagements for humanity and social science. Uh, some other researchers, for example, from the chemistry, they had a conversation, they had a quite a strong interest in looking at the list of uh, all the uh, conferences that they're attending. So there are different fields with different interests. They actually provide different picture of what is important for them. If you are interested in this, this is a gentleman to talk to you about. <laughs> uh, so Melroy has been the kind of a sponsor from day one of this project and kind of the main brain behind this pushing that is continuously uh, kind of poking myself and my team to say, well, what's happened to the next component and next component? Uh, we are planning to go to this co-design phase with different research groups. Uh, if you are interested, uh, if you think there's a researchers in your university who would benefit from this, uh, send an email to Melroy and then we connect them to our workshops. Thank you. So we do have a few minutes for questions. Can we have the lights back on so we don't trip over each other? Um, <coughs> does anyone have any questions about the PID graph or any of them? Yes, I think we need a microphone. We have microphones. We have now, microphones. Thanks for your talk. Um, how does your data compare with what you see in the commercial databases? Is it comparable? Uh, 
Okay, that is a complicated answer because what happens is that the research graph from the data that is created, we had engagement with Elsevier and uh, Thomson Reuters. And we have a corpus of their data into the graph ecosystem. However, that is what we consider a closed data set. So a lot of information that you see here is uh, not exposing any of those metadata because they are copyrighted at the moment. So we have agreements in place to use the data for the research purposes, but we can actually expose it back. Saying that, we, we have the engine which has been trained. It's a graph database that's been trained from that perspective. And we know the relationship uh, for things like if there are two titles uh, with, um, for example, the Perl or the uh, ARC ID or other sort of identifiers, we can actually link them to the networks in the graph. So you would get values from that ecosystem, but you wouldn't get those metadata back. Example of this one was uh, Caroline that I showed. Uh, that was her ORCID profile, which wasn't that complete. Like she has about uh, 50 papers, but she only has about five on the ORCID profile. Uh, we, we don't add other things to this for that reason. Uh, but if the university has any, in, in the context of research, then we would be able to work with that data set, but not in the context of uh, commercial work. Thanks. Uh, one more question is, um, in your existing data set or going forward, can you get timestamp data of the ORCID record so that you can plot trends over time? Yes, we have the archive of ORCID going back to 2014, if I'm not mistaken. Yes, uh, so, uh, but I think our, uh, our data so is not from the first day of ORCID, a uh, couple of days after that, but we have the, uh, for a period of time, we have a, uh, I think every six months update, and then after, uh, recently we have almost every week. Are there any other questions? Adrian. Thanks. Um, and what about the questions that you asked at the beginning there? the prospective things about uh, what opportunities is Carolyn missing out on? Is there, uh, have the systems sort of pointed out directions for finding out that information? That's a very good question. I don't, uh, this is kind of a journey. So we are heading in that, that direction. I don't think we have an answer for this now. We can identify the people that uh, Caroline should work with them, uh, but we can't tell at the moment that what are the opportunities are missing. It's very much at the moment is a cutting edge research into that concept of identifying who can work with whom. And the reason that it's, it's complicated is not just linking people, it's all different social factors around this that are they available or not. But one of the things we start doing this recently is looking at the research capacities. So if the, if the a new round of funding comes through and there are new projects spinning out, and then we look at this, okay, well, there are researchers in this field that are very much connected to that topic. So they might be able to actually collaborate together because there's new funding available in that area. All right. Uh, we do have time for one more question. Mandeep, just wait till that microphone comes. Uh, thanks, Samir. Uh, just uh, there's a lot of focus on the collaboration part, but outside academia. So a lot of this the information there is inside academia. A lot of, you know, into university collaboration and so are there any have you got any thoughts on you know that outside academia collaboration because the government wants you know what are we getting for all the money mm -hmm. you know taxpayers are you know funding so you mentioned the uh, one of the health organization there but more than that what's happening for example in patents or industry or jobs or stuff outside academia i guess is probably so, oh, yeah. Yeah. so, yes, uh, so I'll just, well, <laughs> I, I briefly mentioned, I'll pass it to Laurie. So that's kind of a very big problem. And Amir, is, sorry, can you uh, repeat the question? Okay, please? so the, the question is that, uh, what about the industry engagement? So I talked about the publication related to industry, but there are more than that, there are patents and there are the commercial engagements and there are other form of partnerships serving on the board and other, uh, uh, kind of variations of that collaboration. And also the other things that kind of add to that, uh, uh, it, when the students graduate and they go and work for a company or government industry, and then you chain all of those uh, links. So the very quick answer to this one is at the moment we're working on the patents part. That is a very active part of our research. Uh, there's a lots of other open questions here to answer. Uh, 
So there, this is the area that we would love to collaborate with any researcher, any university who would like to work on this topic. But at the moment, there's a couple of pillars that we are working on, and I think we kind of right now with IQ Australia, with aim for the looking at the patterns in relation to different uh, organizations in that line. Right. I mean, <coughs> there's a fundamental um, challenge with trying to understand university, sorry, industry university collaborations or spin outs or patents, right? In that generally when you move into industry, your IP is closed. Whereas when you're in academia, your IP is open. Uh, so in our interactions with patent uh, organizations, whether it's EPO or a firm, right, that does a lot of patenting, generally what the firm will say is, it's not the people, it's the environment that the people are in. And so we don't really care about the people. And so trying to get them engaged around identifiers is problematic on a person level. And I think also from an IP perspective, generally patents also tend to be obfuscated, right? What's in the patent? And so there's actually a kind of cultural change that probably would need to happen for us to be effective in really trying to understand what those connections are outside of academia. It's a, I think this is a longer term thing. If we can, I think as we build out the PID graph in academia and provide the value to industry and why it's important to see these connections, I think we'll see more industry folks getting engaged. And I'm, we're starting to see it in the pharmaceutical <clears throat> realm because there's a lot of publications that happen there. And I think we can maybe start there and get a toehold and start building it out. And the patent organizations, EPO, USPTO, are interested um, but there's a there's a there's a long road there, just a really long road, and we've kind of put it aside because we got many many other things to work on. And I think we need to show the benefit in our community, the open community, first before the patent folks are going to pay attention. Uh, one thing I can add to the pattern part is that uh, the problem of the problem of the pattern is that people who register patent usually don't have ORCID ID. Um, and on the, one thing I can say, or give the credit, uh, in Swinburne there's a group called uh, CTI, Center for Transformative Information, and uh, that team has done amazing work on disambiguating the name of people on the patent uh, uh, applications using the AI. Uh, that is an ongoing relationship with uh, IP Australia. So if you are interested, I think uh, Beth Webb, Professor Beth Webster would be the best person to contact. I can link you. I think we've actually run out of time. I'm sorry. I know there's lots of questions, but we are, um, we're having lunch soon and we have a panel before lunch. So uh, could you join with me in thanking Melroy and Amir? And there will be time for questions at lunchtime uh, as well. So um, in the next uh, panel, we're going to have a panel who are going to be presenting on PIDs for the future of Australian research. We're going to be asking some questions of the panel members who will respond to those questions and we have a bit of dialogue about, um, about those questions. Uh, I'd like to thank Linda O'Brien for offering to chair this session, but she, she's a very busy person. She's uh, Pro Vice Chancellor, University Lib Librarian and uh, Head of Logan Campus, so she has meetings to go to. So she can't actually stay for the whole uh, panel, so I'll chair the next panel, but I'd like to thank Linda also who is a, a member of our ORCID board and a really strong supporter of um, the ORCID organisation. So if our panel members could come up, please, and then we'll go through uh, the questions that we're going to go through for the panel. So our panel consists of uh, Adrian Burton, uh, Director of Data Policy and Services at ARDC. Uh, we have Justin Withers from the ARC. I don't know if Mandip is coming and joining you up here as well. Um, we have Margie Janty, who is past president of the Council of Australian University Librarians, a call. And we have Laurie Huck as well on our panel. So just give us a few moments for everyone to get ready up the front, and we'll need to use those microphones when we're speaking on the panel there. Hopefully we have enough microphones. And we're preparing for a town hall meeting at one o'clock in, in the other building. So. Um, We'll go through till 12.30. Lunch is supposed to be at 12.15, but should be okay to, to delay that till 12.30, if everyone agrees. Um, so we have a series of questions for the panel. So the first question, and any of you can answer this question, either way you want to go, is 
how do we communicate and educate the research sector about the importance of peers? Oh, that's a difficult question. <laughs> you can either take the carrot or the stick approach. Um, and to a certain extent, I think, uh, you know, with ORCID integration in the, in the system for ARC, um, we have provided a, a carrot approach that uh, would make your life easier if you, uh, if you uh, use ORCID or, and also um, other permanent uh, persistent uh, digital identifiers as well in pre-populating and managing your information. Um, I guess it's about making life easier. Um, there are champions out there, we know that. Um, and as with the ORCID um, integration and the push for ORCID, it's come from the sector itself. Um, I think with uh, the, refresh, the refreshing of the research sector by new, new researchers coming forward and, uh, and becoming uh, more prominent in their fields, the sort, of, uh, the sort of work that they do and, and their systems and the way that they approach their work and the information is going to filter down through, through, uh, through the system more generally into junior researchers. That's my two bobs worth. So would anyone else like to say perhaps who has that role of educating the researchers? So who are the champions? What do we do? We, you know, where does that role sit? Now he's asked me that. <laughs> <laughs> I've got the microphone. I've got the microphone. I, I mean, I think, you know, what, well, all of us in this room have a, have a role to play, and I think that's the understanding of um, the various professional and subject matter expertise that each of our organisations that are represented here today and those who aren't, the role we play in the research ecosystem. Um, and, you know, it's, you know, it's about how do you divide this up? You know, who, who the, who's the market segment, for example? You know, um, how do we approach, you know, graduate research schools? How do we, you know, work with the early career researcher? How do we work with the more established researchers? And, and so forth. Um, but going back to the, the earlier question, I think there's an opportunity here um, to, to really amplify how PIDs can enable trust in the, the research endeavour, the research activity and the research outputs, particularly publicly funded outputs, and give us that line of provenance of an idea, how a, a, a challenge is being addressed, um, who, who are the collaborators, um, who are the partners in, in all of this, when there, there is an element of, I guess, distrust or disquiet um, out there in, in our um, society, in our economies and so forth. So this is one way of being able to do that, by having those identifiers um, um, clearly linked right from the beginning um, of an idea. And I think what we really need to continue to do is be very clear on the value proposition, again, coming, addressing multiple needs, multiple um, challenges that um, our, our researchers um, face within the work that they do. So again, as Justin said, how do we remove the administrative overhead? because they don't have time for adding another layer because I think this has the potential to become a really complex environment for those who are not deeply immersed in it. So um, how do we, what's, how is it going to make them more visible, recognisable? Um, I think the points that were made earlier in our, with our previous speaker in terms of who are they collaborating with? How do we actually visualise that, make that more open for others to see where those connections are? Again, to again, really showcase how significant the research and activity is and, and where it's making a difference and touching point, you know, different industries, sectors, the globe and so forth. Great, yes. Adrian. Yeah, the, um Value is really where it is. I mean, you can educate as much as you like and even incentivize or even bring out the strong arms of Justin uh, if necessary. Uh, you know, going from carrot to very hard carrot to stick. But you know, we've all had seen that, that researchers are a very good example of human beings in that um, if it makes sense and it will save them time and it solves the problem, then they would definitely do it. Very few of them would do it for the national good. They might, but you know, a, a small part would. So anyway, I think coming back to uh, what, we're, what we're actually educating is how this can save time. And, and if it's not, then I think the people in the room have the, um, have the responsibility there to make sure that there are some applications where it is making things easier, saving time. If you, turn, if you have 
this app on your phone and you turn it on and you've used an orchid, you know, look at all the benefits you get uh, is uh, usually the best way of, uh, of education. Now, people do know we are at a startup phase and we've had the, luck, the luxury or the, the good planning in our sector to have a consortium, to have a, a principal statement, to have the ARC and other funders show leadership and, and infrastructure support. Um, and so, yes, there is a certain amount of awareness that, that happens with that, but I think that us in the room here have the um, responsibility of making sure that it solves some problems and then uh, water will find its natural level in that sense. Yeah, I think we need to stay the, stay the course. Um, invariably, the people who are disgruntled with the system or how things work tend to get a lot of airtime uh, and, and traction with those people that don't know. Um, Look, for example, our, we would consider our orchid integration, which occurred last year, to be very successful. Um, so currently we have over 20,000 users in our RMS system with an orchid profile, um, and more than 8,000 of those researchers have pulled research outputs um, using their orchid ID. Um, and then we have over 841,000 research outputs in our system from, from harvesters from orchids. So that's a good news story. But invariably, there was you know half a dozen people that struggled to do that, uh, and they're the ones that make noise. Um, so we need to stay the course. Um, we've built this system for the long term, um, orchids in it for the long term, um, and you now we can address some of these issues that are raised. Um, but we need to stay positive in the fact that um, what we're doing and what we're building is is, is working. But you know we acknowledge that it can be improved. Um, but for the most part, I think people are happy with it. Now, I'll hand over to Mandeep now. He's a PID nerd when he answered those questions earlier on. Um, so <laughs> he might better give some more technical advice. Uh, I'll stay from the, away from the device. So just a uh, couple of things from my perspective. I think uh, from the slides which were shown by Adrian and Natasha, one thing was clear, the landscape is too big. It is confusing. If you, if you are a researcher, it confuses you. Uh, it's important that, uh, from my perspective, there are couple of players and those players provide what's needed for the sector. When you have that many, you can't sustain it. That's just the reality. Now, Orchid, I believe, has you know established itself. It is slowly getting ingrained into the landscape, but there are a lot of other things, and I think that's where DOIs are, are, are good. But you know, we talked about this. Somebody mentioned research infrastructure from UQ, uh, samples, all those things. I think you know the identify for organization. Now, some of these are paid services as well. So you can't actually have 10 different providers, and you don't, you don't know the sustainability of all of them. Uh, so it's important that we have a sustainability. We have less confusing system. We got a couple of players who can probably do the job. I don't know who those players are. Obviously, Orchid is there, and it will be there, I believe, for the long term. So I think somehow, if as a community, we can s sort of almost lead what that landscape looks like uh, going forward. I think that's the key to have, and that's not just in Australia, it has to be universal. Research is not, you know, for a country, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's a global platform, I guess, so, so it has to be, it has to be a global sort of discussion, so. Okay, thank you. Um, so that kind of leads us into our second, we've covered most of the things, I think, in our first question, uh, which were around, what are the challenges uh, we need to, um, you know, there are barriers to, to implementing systems, but we need to be sustainable and work together as a community.